So welcome. This is uh, Mastering Joints in Fusion 360. My name is Bryce Heventhal, and I'm the Technical Marketing Manager for Fusion 360. Um, today we're going to be talking about how to assemble your designs. So you first probably started off with designing some parts. We're going to show you how to start assembling them using joints. So to start off here, um, we're going to go ahead and um, start up by describing two different types of assembly modeling. Um, one would be bottom-up assembly modeling, and the other would be top-down assembly modeling. Bottom-up is very uh, you, familiar to traditional CAD users, where you design every part in a different file, and then you assemble them into an assembly file in the end. Um, this is a traditional way. Fusion 360 can do this. I'll show you a little bit of mixture. Um, but what we, what we like to do a lot in Fusion 360 is called top-down design. What this is is designing parts in context of each other. So for instance, let's say you have a uh, cell phone and you want to design a case around it. Instead of having these in two separate files where you have to jump back and forth, back and forth to uh, uh, make measurements and then go dimension a sketch and then go make measurements again, we could design this all in one file. The perks of this is maybe we could say rather um, we want this case to be five millimeters offset from the outside edge of the phone. We could use things like offset entities, convert entities, projected project the sketch into the active sketch. So we can re reuse a lot of these top-down philosophies. Where this really excels is when we make design changes in the future. Let's say your boss comes along and we design that phone case still. And he comes and says, well, we want the phone to be five millimeters larger. And instead of having to update all those for the phone case, it's since every, if everything's parametrically driven off of that initial design, top-down design really helps drive those design changes downstream. So those are the two main, I'm going to show a little bit of both. Um, when I'm in Fusion 360, I like to do a little bit of a mixture. Um, I, I like to do a combo of bottom-up and top-down design. And I've used lots, quite a few CAD tools out there, and uh, most of them out there make you go one way or the other. You either start bottom-up and you're kind of stuck in that bottom-up assembly modeling, um, or you're in that top-down and you're st strictly doing top-down design. So let's go ahead and keep going, though. So um, another thing that I just want to make sure that everyone understands in Fusion 360 is when bodies are turned into components. So as you're designing, you have the option to turn bodies into components. These are two big separate um, differentiators in Fusion. Watch out for these. So if you're ever, the main reason to turn bodies into components is either a bill of materials. You're trying to get maybe make, turn this into manufacturing and you need that um, bill of materials or to add assembly motion. Unfortunately, bodies cannot move relative to each other if it's two different bodies. But if they're two different components, they can move relative to each other. So there's multiple places. I, uh, the unfortunate thing about fusion, uh, we always say that there's 10 ways to do the same thing. It's very flexible. Um, there's two main ways to make bodies into components. So as you're extruding that body or sweeping it, as you're making that into a 3D feature, there's usually an operation box. Um, in the property manager. So what this operation box will let you do is do different Boolean operations like join, cut, intersect, or create a new body or new component. Um, or you have the browser on the left side of your screen. Um, I'll go ahead and demonstrate this as well, but it will have a bodies folder in it. And you could right click those bodies or you could right click the bodies in the graphics area, the viewport, and uh, say create components from bodies. So either way, um, a lot of different users will try to make components early or make components early in the design process. So right when you make that first extrusion, you make it a component, and then you start um, designing uh, on that one component. I personally like to do uh, keep them as bodies. I don't see a really b a big downside to keep them as bodies as long as possible because you get a lot more different features you could do to multiple bodies. Um, and then I like to create components when I'm ready. So when I want to make a bill of materials or when I want to apply assembly motion. Um, the only bad thing um, is if you get a lot of bodies, you'll get a huge list of bodies and it gets a little bit confusing. I try to rename, my big tip is try to rename bodies as you create bodies if you want to go with that workflow. Okay, so just make sure um, at this point, all my designs are mostly going to be components. Um, not bodies, and each component will have a body inside of it, and I'll show you that in a second. So let's start off with some joint creation. Um, 
So there's two, the old way and the new way Fusion 360 way does it. These are just some differentiators. I'm going to cover a couple of them. Um, when I first started using Fusion 360, um, uh, one of the product managers told me one thing that, uh, um, one, th one of the product managers that told me that uh, um, uh, the difference between the mates or um, constraints, as you would recall them in other old traditional CADs and joints, is what you try to do with mates and constraints is you try to lock down all those degrees of freedom. So what we really have are six degrees of freedom. A component can move and translate along three axes, or it can rotate along in three directions. So what you're trying to do is usually take three mates or constraints to fully define that part in the assembly. Well, the difference here is Fusion, what we do is we lock down all those degree of freedom at once, and then we unlock them with different types of joints. I'm going to show that here in a second, but that's the main differentiator, as well as there's some other things like joints are, are in the timeline, and I'll go ahead and mention that later in the process as well. So let's go ahead and just jump in and uh, oh, one more slide. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is while you're doing joint creation, just remember to put this there. Um, so what you're saying is put this, that is your first component, there is your second component. So what we're saying is assemble this component to this component. And uh, we're going to talk about joint origins here in a second. So let's jump into Fusion. Um, so what we have are just some components. This is kind of maybe something that was designed in top-down. I just wanted to show a mixture of all the different commands we had in top-down and bottom-up assembly modeling. But as you can see right now, everything's kind of floating in free space. So what I could do is drag things around, move them around. And you see that nothing really knows where it is relative to each other. And I'm going to go ahead and hit revert. And I'm going to explain what revert does later. But revert will bring it back to the original position um, where it was last saved in the timeline. So there's some point in here, and I can tell you the last one was this snapshot, where it stored the location of all these components. I'm going to bring that back up a little bit later. Um, that's a very important topic. But let's go ahead and start designing. So um, when I first start assembling, you always want to fix or ground something in the assembly. Because right now, everything's floating in space. Um, so what I like to do is maybe pick a component that doesn't move, um, like a base component. So in that case, it's probably this plate here. So what I could do is right-click it in the graphics area and say ground, or I could find it in the uh, browser over here and say ground. And once it's ground, you'll see a little pin comes up here, and it actually places a feature in the timeline for the ground as well. So if I see right now, if I click and drag, I can't move that component around. It's fixed in space. Or, But if I move that back in time, you'll see that it's floating in space. It's now able to move. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk, talk a little bit later about that, why joints are in the timeline. But let's continue to assemble some things. Um, so first off, we have this pin now floating in space, yeah, so let's put it back. Um, so what I want to do is fix this pin with this uh, um, plate we just had. So let's start by invoking our joint command. So we could go ahead and say joint, and we could go ahead and select a component. And you see that on this cylindrical face here, I actually get three manipulators. Watch out for those. I'm going to explain those as later, but those are different joint origins we can create. With cylinders, um, it put places three of them. So one at the uh, um, one at the top, one at the bottom, and one always in the middle. So I'll take that one in the middle, and then I'm going to go ahead and use that same selection over on this. But you'll see that when I hover on this inside cylindrical face, what happens is I also get three of them. But when I try to go to that bottom one or the middle one, it selects this face instead. So what I could do is hold your command key or control key for Windows, command for Mac. And now it will keep that selected when I was hovering over that face. So now I can go and select that bottom point if I needed to. But I'm going to select that middle point. And we created our first joint. So now those are locked into place with each other. Um, we had one question. Um, should, your, should you ground items relative to the model space origin? Um, great question. So back in the day when I used to do in traditional CAD tools, we always went in our assembly kind of at the 0, 0, 0 start point. Here, I don't see a huge advantage to doing that. If you wanted to, you could uh, come in here and select the origin and kind of align them. Um, I, I've had the origin hidden, and luckily it actually looks like they were aligned in this case. But in this, I don't see a huge advantage of having it locked to the origin. Some people just like to do it because of standards and keep the company try to keep doing the same thing. 
Um, so but let's keep assembly. So what I want to do is I want to pop this piece over here onto this piece. Um, but before I do it, you'll see that these are actually just three pieces floating together. So what we could do is create a joint and these rigid joint, what those do, I just create, used one on that pin over there, is it locks all six degrees of freedom down. But instead of doing that, what I, I have three components here. So what I would have to do is one to one and then accept it, do another joint for the other one. So since they're all going to be rigid anyways, what we can do is something called a rigid group. So this is very similar to just making multiple joints as rigid, but a lot faster. So I could come in here and select these three components, hit OK, and you'll see I get a rigid group and a time down here. And now these are all fixed and fixed together. They're rigidly connected to each other. So if you have multiple components that are all just, you just want them all locked down together, like maybe a bunch of fasteners, and they're already in this, the right location um, because you design them like that, um, you could go ahead and use a rigid group. So now I'm going to throw this component onto this space here. And you're going to see me do this a lot um, as I'm, I, I like to click and drag things to see if they still um, they move like I expect them to. And when I do that, these two buttons come up here, snapshot and revert. I'm going to go ahead and tell you what snapshot is. Bring them back to where I started before I started dragging them. And I'll explain why we use snapshots in a little bit. So now I want to place this component onto this, just like this hub, to complete this hub. So we'll again use our joint command. And different things. And you see as I hover over different entities, um, I get different joint origins. That's the, all these little dots that I can use. So if I, let's say I want to go into that center. If I hold my command key while over this face, you'll see it keeps it selected so I can hover around and it doesn't select other faces. Or if I just hover over this edge, it's going to get the, the center of that cylindrical edge. So I'll just go ahead and select that. And I'll go ahead and come over here and select this guy as well, corresponding edge. And luckily, it came in the right direction. Um, if it doesn't, sometimes what happens is it comes in flipped. We could go ahead and flip that if we needed to. Um, also, sometimes uh, um, what I like to do is I, I don't like to model everything because maybe we don't we have like a rubber gas in there that's kind of some weird shape that we don't want to spend time uh, modeling, but we still want to maybe have maybe like a tensile offset in in um, for that rubber gasket to fit. But so we could come in here and say maybe we want like 10 millimeters and it's going the wrong direction. So I'll just say maybe we want 10, 10, negative 10 millimeters. And you see how it places that offset right there. And very similarly, we can do an angle, but it's hard to see in this one. All it's going to do is rotate this around relative. Um, so let's say I want to put 20 degrees. You'll see that shift 20 degrees. So let's go ahead and knock those back down to zero. And we'll go ahead and hit OK. So another rigid joint. We're going to get into some fancier joints here in a second. So now what I'm going to do is start assembling the rest of this piece. So I'm going to put this component onto the plate over here as well. So this one we're going to allow some assembly motion. So previously this may probably would have taken me two to three mates or constraints to make. Now we could come in here and create a joint. So I'm going to say I want my joints to go from this cylindrical edge to this cylindrical edge over here. You see it fully locks it and it gives you that animation. Um, but let's say we have a different motion type. So we could come in here and say maybe we want a cylindrical and you'll see it's going up and down. Obviously that's probably not the intended motion. We could try maybe a ball. That's definitely not the intended motion. So the, what we really want is a revolute. So you'll get used to them after watching the animations. Um, so once I say revolute, it goes in the right direction. It always goes normal to the, at the edge selected, so it, the edge is, creates a plane. But if it goes along the wrong direction, you can select a different axis if you needed to. So for some reason, if I needed it to rotate that way, I could choose the Y axis. I'll go ahead and leave it at the Z, though. Or you could uh, use sketch lines or sketch or uh, axes to, and select a custom one. So I'll leave it at Z and hit OK. Some users, when I first started teaching this, were like, I hate that animation. Um, to be honest, it bugged me at first, but I kind of like it, um, especially when you start using some of these other higher end um, types of joints, because it, it, it really shows you where you're locking your degrees of freedom down and what motion you're allowed to move. 
So I did like it, but just in case you don't like it, if you come up to your name, hit the preferences box. Under design, you can turn off the animate a joint preview. Um, I personally like to leave it, but if it bugs you a lot, feel free to turn it off. So let's keep on going though. So now we'll go ahead and move this, and you see, as I, just as I expected, it rotates just as I need it to. But every time I move it, I have to revert it back. The reason is, when I do that, what it's doing, let's say I move it here, um, it's going to capture its, uh, I change its location from the last place, the last one the joint set. So what I, actually happens is, let's say I want to joint this pin into this hole. Um, when I hit the little joint button, and you see I have a revert and snapshot up here, it's going to prompt me two things. It's either going to say capture your position, which essentially is a snapshot, or continue, which is going to revert it back to where it was. So I'm going to, I don't really like this position. I'm going to show some examples of using that snapshot to benefit your design. But here, I, I don't really care, so I'm just going to say continue. It's going to revert it back. So again, I will go ahead and center this along these two faces. But this is tricky sometimes. Um, let's say I want to grab this joint origin right here, and I want this shaft to be aligned right through the middle of this uh, hang, this hanging piece right here. Um, but if you see, I don't have anything to select over here, and all my joint origins are on the face. Um, this is often called a width mate, or you would have to come in and create extra planes to, to uh, make constraints to planes right down the middle. Here, while I'm going to select my second joint origin, right click and select between two faces. It's a little bit hidden, I know, um, but once you select between two faces, it's going to prompt you to do two faces. So I could come here and say between this face and this face. And once it does that, what it really does is it puts like a plane right, it calculates a plane right through the middle. So now I could hover over different things and you see how the joint origin, I can't move my mouse because it's a going to disappear, but there's a joint origin right in the middle of those two faces. But I could hover on different things, and you'll see that that joint origin propagates right to that plane. So in this case, I'll go ahead and select this circular edge, and voila, it pops it right in there exactly where I want it. And I'll go ahead and leave it rigid. And okay. But now I fully put that joint in there with one, one type of joint, didn't have to create extra planes or anything like that. Fairly easy. Just remember right-clicking when you make that second component. I'm going to show you another example of that as well a little bit later. Um, but let's go ahead and finally finish this up. Um, by the way, other hotkeys, you'll see me use them all the time. And it's kind of bugging me using these menus up here. But I'm always using J and Shift J. Um, so if I hit my J key, um, you'll see that it pops me right into the joint command. So I'll finish that off. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hold my command key so I can select that middle one again. This is that instance where I can't get to that middle joint origin without selecting a different face. So as I'm hovering over that cylindrical face, hold command or control, jump onto that middle point, and again, I will pop it onto this middle one as well. And don't worry if you only see one component go over there. What it's doing, it's only previewing one component to one component because that's the component I selected for the joint origin. Some users are like, whoa, my assembly is still over there, and I made those all rigid. Um, what's going on? But once I f fully make this what it was, so I want to revolute, hit OK, you'll see that it jumps all over there. It follows the rules. So now you can see I can move this around, spin this just as I wanted to. But as I've been working this entire time, my uh, design team has been working on a different design for the wheel, um, for the, the rubber piece that goes over this. So this is where the bottom-up assembly modeling comes in. Usually, sometimes the designer will design one component in each file. I like to design as much as I can into one file. Um, but over here, I could go to my data panel. I could browse for that file. Maybe my colleague was making it. And I could right-click and say, insert into, new, into current design. And what that's going to do is just throw that design into my design right here. Fairly simple. Takes a second. It's rep. It's uh, going up to the cloud right now and finding that file. Um, and what you can do is you can move this around if you want to. It throws you right into the move command by default. There's really I use it kind of just to move it to get out of my way so I could pop it back to what I want to select. But there's really no advantage to moving it right now. So I'll go ahead and hit OK. Do notice that it puts a link on my part in the assembly tree. Um, if I needed to, this is. Uh, 
really cool. I can open the file, and what it's just going to do is open this file, so I can make some changes to that file. I could break the link. Let's say uh, I don't trust my other colleagues. I'm going to break that link right now because I, this is a good state of it, and I know they're going to make a design change and break everything. Or you could choose a version. I think this is one of the most powerful things. So Fusion, what it does is it creates versions for every shape. Um, and other tools, it's, you're, um, when you open up an assembly, it's loading the latest version of all your files. You don't get to choose maybe like, I want to go to version 1 out of 7. You have to make separate different files like that unless you have a complicated PDM system. Here, I could say, ah, I don't like that. I can maybe choose version to like a different, and it's going to show me all my different versions down here. Fortunately, I only have one version on this guy. But that's very powerful because maybe Joe Schmo comes along and changes something about this wheel that's horrible. Um, instead of having to redesign and make changes to fix it back to the state, we can just roll back and choose it to version one where it's perfectly fine. Um, let's go ahead and, and finally, uh, the other thing is if, let's say I open this up, make a design change, rather than automatically lo um, loading wheel version 2, it will keep me wheel version 1, but it will prompt me to make a change. Um, this is just some tips I wanted to show, share with you. So let's go ahead and finally join this back up. So we'll select that, get that middle point, and we'll cover over this face and get that point. Okay. And we want that to be working. Okay. And now you can see we quickly assembled our caster wheel here and applied the correct motion. So let's go ahead and jump and just summarize a little bit what we did. So just remember that put this there. So put the first component to the second component. That's where you want it to do. To be honest, it really doesn't matter for which the order that you select them. It's going to abide the correct rules. It's just that preview that, it, that really matters. It'll preview in the wrong direction if you select the other way. So joint origins, I've been talking about them, I've been mentioning them. Um, these are those little points I've been talking about. So let me go ahead and jump over back to Fusion and look at a different file. Sorry, I did have all these queued up, but fortunately Fusion, um, I had to restart Fusion at the beginning of this. Here we go. Okay, so this is, uh, again, just another component. Um, and I just want to show you different things that joint origin has. Uh, what, how joint our origins occur. So when I come in here and say I want to create a joint, you'll see as I hover over certain faces, there's a ton of different points that come up. Um, what it does is it usually puts one at the center of an arc. It puts one, as you can see over here, there's one at the center above this arc as well. It put one, puts one at each vertex. So we're all like the arcs and lines combined. It puts one at the midpoint as well of that arc or line or that edge. Um, and sometimes um, what happens is, let's, for example, come over to this edge right here. Um, if you see the joint origin, if I hover over this face, the origin is facing parallel to the plane, coplanar with that face that I was hovering over. So sometimes I want the joint origin face that, look, that way. Um, other times, where if I hover over this edge first and then go to that point, you'll see that it, it made it, uh, I guess, perpendicular to that edge. So depending on what you have selected, it's going to rotate that joint origin. Don't worry. Most of the time when you go in to make those joints, uh, let me go ahead and make something real quick. Uh, when I go, let's say I went that guy and this guy. Let's just pick that easy one on that face. You'll see what it's going to do is try to make those two joint origins the same direction. Don't worry, you can usually always fix it with um, changing the angle or something like that. But you see how, let me show you that again. Um, so if I hover over this guy, um, it's going to rotate this 90 degrees because this joint origin is facing along that edge. And it's going to make that edge face, it's going to match that joint origin with the new joint origin I selected. So just depending on what you have hovered, it changes the direction of that joint origin. Other things you could do with the joint origin is uh, um, we can create them manually. Let's say I, for some weird reason, I want a joint origin at this location right here. So what we could do is create a sketch. Uh, I can grab a point, place it right here. Um, I could dimension to that point if I needed to. Let's say from that edge to there, put that at 30, this edge to here, also make that 30. 
And once I hit stop sketch, I could come in here and say joint origin under the assemble menu. And what this was going to enable me to do is select the point, and I could come in here and control the angle, the offset. I can make the joint for some reason weigh offset off that point at like 20 millimeters if I needed to. Or I can also change the way that joint origin is faced by saying reorient it and choosing the Z and X, Y axis. So I could say Z axis, I want it that way. You see how the joint origin is now at that point but facing the other direction. Usually you don't have to do things like this. This is a little bit more complicated scenarios that might arise. But just in case, now you have it in the tool set to make your own joint origins and relocate it. But I'm going to go ahead and cancel. I'll be honest, I probably create my own joint origins one out of 50 times creating joining things. The joints usually get maybe 90% there, and then I have to get tricky maybe 5% of the time. Um, we had a question, is this webinar going to be available online? Yes, it will be. If you go to YouTube and then just search Fusion 360, we have a web, um, in our ch uh, channel, we have a playlist called webinars. There's some good ones if you're trying to learn simulation or just quick tips or something like that. So let's keep going, though. Um, so I just explained the joint origin, a um, couple different things. Uh, here, here's that different feedback that you can get. So if you could see, we could get different points depending on what we hover over and what we're, what our uh, geometry is. And then the feedback, the sideways on the edge and the flat on the face for that joint origin. And then cylindrical feedback as well. We get three, one at each end, and then one in the middle. Just remember, if you want to get to the one in the middle and you can't really see it, it's out of your view, hold your command or control key to lock the highlight so you can come over here and select it. And here's just some just brief um, explanation of the different joint types. So we have rigid. What these literally do lock down all six degrees of freedom. So this component here is not able to translate or rotate relative to this component. We have our revolute joint. This is able to just um, lock, uh, releases one joint, one degree of freedom, I mean, um, the rotational degree of freedom around a certain axis, and we can pick which axis. The cylindrical joint. What this does is it releases one revel or one rotation and one translation. So it's able to rotate around one axis, and it's usually able to translate around that same axis. So this, in this case, it would be able to slide over and then pop down this um, cylindrical joint. The slider, what it does is just releases one degree of freedom, a translation. So it's able to slide back and forth. The pin slot, what this is, is basically releasing rotation and translation in one degree. Very similar to the slider, but instead the translation motion is perpendicular to the rotation. The planer, this allows two translations. So it's able to slide along a plane. And then finally, the ball. Um, the ball allows all three degrees of rotational degree of freedom uh, free, so it's able to rotate around the ball. Um, very cool. So I'll go ahead and sh uh, show a couple more examples. Um, so you saw all those uh, I just showed you right there. Let me go ahead and open up another example. All right. So all of the between two faces, um, I, I like to make sure that everyone knows what between two faces. I think it's one thing that uh, a lot of people don't see, but it's uh, um, very useful, extremely useful. Let's say I want to allow the rotation right down the middle of these two faces. So again, I'm going to use my joint key. Um, another little quick tip that I always like to throw in there is use your S key. Um, your S key changes depending on which environment you're in, which workspace, and this is fully customizable. So for instance, I have my joints here. But um, sometimes I don't know if it's there, so I just usually hit F and then just start typing joint. And it will come up with everything that has joint in it. So you see why I have rubber joint. It highlights this one up here. Um, so I can invoke that. And that S key changes which workspace. So for some reason, I uh, jump into my render workspace. It's probably a bad idea to jump into that one. But when I hit my S key, I get different commands. And you can customize that as well. So let's go back into the model, though. And I'm going to go ahead and say I want to make a joint. I'm going to select that middle point because that's where I want it aligned right down the middle. And then I'm going to go ahead and remember, right-click when you're going to select your second component and say between two faces. So I'm going to go ahead and select those two faces. And I will select where I want them to locate. And 
it, depending on what I hover over, it's going to propagate that joint orange in the middle. Maybe I want this component on the left side over here. So I'll just go ahead and select that point, and it propagates it right into the middle. And I can still apply offsets, but this between two faces avoids me to have it, having to uh, apply the offset because it puts it right in the middle. And I don't want it to be rigid. I want it to be able to rotate, so I'll say revolute. And you see the between two faces works for all the different joint types. So we have the revolute joint here. And I'm also going to come over here and do it on this one. And this one's going to be a lot slightly trickier. So notice that these faces are angled. And I'm going to have to do it twice because I don't really have anything down the center of these things that I can select or that I'm telling you that I can select because I want to do it a little bit trickier. So I'm going to say joint again. And I'm going to go ahead and this time, instead of selecting something, which I've been doing, I'm going to right click on my first component and say between two faces. Here, I could go ahead and select these two angled faces, that one and that one. And then as I hover around, you'll see that it wakes up the different points on these faces. So I'm going to go ahead and select this middle one. And it gets that point right in the middle. Let's come over here. And I'm going to do that same exact thing over here, but I want to do the between two faces option. So just again, right click between two faces. Select my two angled faces, and then my uh, point that I want them to go into, right there. And I'm going to have this be a slider down the middle, and wrong axis. Let's go down the, yeah, that guy. Hit OK. And unfortunately, it did, which way is it going? Oh, I got the wrong way. Sorry about that. So if you ever need to edit, um, the, there's a couple different ways to edit um, a joint. We have a joints folder over here. Sometimes that gets crazy long and super hard to look at. Um, we do have the joints down here. It was the last joint I created in the timeline. Or if you have your joints visible. So if you have the light bulb on, you can grab it in space, uh, select it, right click, and say edit joint. That's probably my favorite way to do it. It's probably the X it was. And I have to flip it. There we go. I'm not sure what exactly happened there, but uh, there we go. It's now able to slide along that just as I intended it to. And it may put it right down the middle just as we needed it to. Perfect. Um, so let's go ahead and continue on. So uh, let's jump back and um, talk about two different types of joints. So up until this point, I've been using the joint command. What we also have is the as built joints. As built joints are totally new. I've never seen anything like these. Um, they're pretty awesome, in my opinion. When I first, it first blew my mind what they can use, be used for. But joints, what they do is they change both location and define a relationship. So a joint, you can say, move this component here, and we want to make it revolute joint around this joint origin. So this is a great use for bottom-up assembly modeling, where your components are kind of spread out. When you insert a component, it just randomly gets thrown in there and you want to put them together, put this there with a relationship, essentially. As-built joints are only for, um, they only define a relationship. So it's not moving location at all. It's pretty cool. Um, I didn't really understand this at first, but what they're really good for is top-down design and assembly importing. And the reason for this is top-down design, like that iPhone example I was using earlier with the case. I'm going to design this really complicated case around my iPhone. Why do I need to move it away and then put the joint back together? It already knows where it needs to be because I designed it in context. We just need to maybe, maybe say this slides along this axis. The other great scenario is let's say I got a, a assembly file from Inventor, um, and it's all it's it's all assembled correctly. But unfortunately, when we go from stepped file to a F3D or a Fusion file. Um, we don't have the, rela the assembly relations don't map correctly. Um, so what we can do is use as-built joints because the components are all already in this, the right location. They just don't have any relationships yet. So for instance, let's go ahead and jump back. If I was intelligent, I would have opened this, this before. There we go. And let's, this is actually just a file I imported as a step. Um, the only difference is I added some appearances to make the colors different so you guys can see the different components. When you insert, import an assembly um, or a step file, what it does is it doesn't turn on the timeline down here. You may notice there is no timeline. 
Um, cool things you could do with that is uh, it really, maybe you just want to make changes. Maybe I'm a manufacturer. I don't really care how this desi was designed. I don't want to figure out how everything was parametrically built. They update one dimension, everything updates. Here I could come in here and you'll see when I don't have the timeline on, I have a couple new commands. Edit face. And when I go to the move command, which is if you right click and go down to the left, you could select certain faces. It gives you the option to select faces. So I could select this face right here. Oh my god, that, that's, that was stupid. Whoever designed this, they need an extra like 10,000. So I could actually just click and drag this. And they say, oh, actually that's where it's supposed to be. I could actually put real numbers in there so I'm not just eyeballing things. Um, or maybe let's say, um, oh, they didn't add a crazy surface in here. So what we can do is come in here and say edit face. And what it's going to do is essentially turn that face into almost like a T-spline body. So I could come in here and say I want maybe two and two. Um, so it's broken up into more patches. And then I could come in here and say, let's like these guys. Actually, let's go with these guys. These guys and these guys. And drag it up. And then drag these guys down. And give them that wavy thing. So when they're putting their foot on this for this bike pump. Um, sorry, two too meetings in the way. I want to hit OK. Now we have that wavy surface in there. Oops. Let's set that back. But um, for add built joints, the unfortunate part, or it's actually very fortunate, is we need to turn on the, the timeline. To turn on the timeline, right click on the top level here and say capture design history. And what that will do is it will turn on the timeline down here. And you'll see a couple different things. That's saying insert a new component and then a new base feature. Um, that's a, a whole nother day's topic, but now the timeline on and everything I do from now on will get a feature and a timeline. For instance, we want to make some, start assembling this. So let's start making some joints. So now that the timeline's on, we have the option to do as built joints. So let's go ahead and select as built joints. But before I do, I almost forgot, I have to ground the component. And I always like to ground a component to uh, that doesn't move. So for instance, this component doesn't move. I always like to get the base component. So right click that, say ground, you'll see it gets that little pin that knows it's grounded. And let's keep going. So we'll go ahead and use our as built joint. So there this again, this one does not change the location. So I know that this component and this component are already in the right place. I just need to make sure that they know what to do. So I'm going to select that component. Say I want to revolute and I'll grab this edge. And of course, it's going around some weird axis. Let's go ahead and put it easy. Okay. And you're now, we'll see that this is able to rotate around that axis just as expected. So I'll go ahead and revert, put that back. So let's keep doing it. So another, this one is Shift J for the hotkey. Shift J um, is the one I use a lot. Uh, I'm a huge hotkey guy. Uh, there we go. Hit OK. Place it right there. And let's grab one more. J, um, this guy, this guy, grab that one, and then we'll uh, say I want this guy to this guy, I want those to be rigidly connected, as you can see there, I could also use the rigid group, but it's just two components, so no big deal, and the last one, I'm just going to select the slider, so again, you just select the two components, and then where, which direction you really want to slide along, so I'm going to slide along the axis and along the middle, hit OK, and in about two seconds, I fully assembled this thing, and you can see that it has the correct motion. So, some cool stuff here. Um, I just want to break away and show you some other cool assembly tricks we have here. As you can see, I could slide this way around, weird, um, pop it off what it's intended use. Maybe that's probably not intended, so let's go ahead and revert that. And we can either select a joint. Um, if you hold down, sometimes it's hard to select those joints because the geometry is in the way. If you actually hold your mouse button down for like one and a half seconds, it pulls up our select other where we can go and select different things. One of the things is the joint occurrence. So I can select the joint occurrence, right click, and say edit joint limit. What that's going to do is let me put limits from the zero point where it's going to stop. So I'm going to say my maximum minimum. I could also just make it stop in one direction. I always invert these somehow. So let's see if I get it right on my first one. Yep, I did. So I like to test out these numbers. Um, by because it's going to preview it, it's going to pull it off this these points here. Don't worry, once I get it OK, it'll pop it back to the correct location. But let's say if I typed in way too big of a value, you'll know that 
This obviously can't go through that um, cylinder, so that's way too big. So let's drop down to something like 50. That looks good, perfect. Hit OK. And then it pops it back there, and then it's going to stop me when I hit that negative 15, which is in this direction, or the 50, which is in this direction. But that's kind of hard um, coding the value in there. One really cool thing I do like about this, though, is you'll notice when I revert, watch these angles down here. For instance, maybe some reason I needed to know those angles when this is fully collapsed. I could click and pull this, and you'll actually see there's an angle value that's dynamically changing as I move this. So that's happening on every joint um, that's able to move. So you see the slider has a distance value down there. Um, the Revolute has an angle, angular value. Uh, where like cylindrical and things like that would have an angle and a, uh, a distance value. But um, that's good and all. Maybe I really care right when it hits this bar down here, um, what that angle is at. But if you look at it, that 50 that I put in, that was kind of just guessing. Um, and it actually doesn't hit this bar yet where it's supposed to rest. So instead of using these joint limits, so let's go ahead and turn that joint limit off. So I could either do the way I did earlier by selecting joint occurrence out there, or I could come here and say edit joint limit, turn these checkboxes off, hit OK. Um, what now I could do is turn on contact set. I always am afraid to tell many users about this. Um, the reason is do not open up like a full car assembly that has fully detailed components, every screw, every nut, every bolt, every fastener in that car assembly and turn this on um, because it, it calculates the bodies and it's gonna, that's going to be extremely slow unless you have just like a really nice machine. Um, but what we can do under the assembly tree is we have the enable contact set. So I could either turn contact sets on or I could turn all contact. This is the button you want to watch out if you have a really detailed model. So let's say we want to enable contact sets. It pops something in the browser where I could say new contact set. And what I'm essentially saying is this uh, telling Fusion saying this component and this component, this components I selected, one, make sure that you calculate them and that they're not able to run through each other. Because any other time you're able to just drag components through each other, cause interferences, things like that. Now we're saying do not do that. So when I hit OK, you'll see that this component will stop once it fully gets down there. Um, it's actually stopping at the back of this drum here. So that's perfect. But you see that it's actually still sliding through. Now we're having interference here. So what we can do is I could keep adding contact sets, but I'm going to be super lazy and say just enable all contacts. And now you'll see that it will come down, stop right when that those spaces touch. So it stops right there. Um, and you, now we can get those angle values if we needed to. And if I need to disable contact, all you need to do is come in here and say right click disable contact. It just turns it off. And finally, um, while we're still here uh, with this assembly, what I'm going to do is turn on a, a motion study. This is uh, pretty qu quick and easy to show. Um, what it does is pop this little manager up here. So just select a joint. Um, you could select multiple joints as well. And what you could do, um, we have time in this axis. Essentially, it's steps, but we could just assume that it's time. And then the value at on this axis. So let's say at 20 seconds, I come in here and say I want that to be uh, 15 uh, millimeters. So at 20 seconds, going to go down to 15. I could come along and say maybe around like 30. I want that to be 50. So like almost all the way collapsed down. And then let's say back down here, I'm going to come back to negative 15, something like that. So you see, as I play this now, it does that full assembly motion. Um, one, uh, we could change the speed as well, and we could add more joints as well, so we can have this thing like doing weird cylindrical movement while sliding up and down. Let's go ahead and hit cancel, though. All right, so what we just showed you was um, some of the difference between joints and as-built joints. So just remember, use as-built joints a lot for top-down design and assembly motion, or imported assemblies for motion. Now we're going to get into some snapshot and revert. But before I do, I did have one more example that I did want to show you. Um, let's go ahead and... Open this guy, and while that guy's opening, let's also open this guy. Okay, so uh, back to here. Um, this one's quick. Uh, so 
So I have like a screw um, C-clamp that I'm trying to simulate. But you see I'm just able to slide and spin this thing essentially. Um, and there's really no relationship with the screw. Um, so let's go ahead and revert that. And what I can do is I can actually tell it to motion link. So I'm really saying I want this joint to move as this joint moves as well. Great for automation assemblies as well. So I'm going to go ahead and select this joint. I only have one joint out there. And since the cylindrical joint has two different um, uh, motion that, we, that it allows for degrees of freedom, has rotation and um, translation, this satisfies what I want to do. I could also have done a revolute and a slider, but that would have been, been a little bit more complicated where I could get this done with one cylindrical. So I, all I have to do is say link with same joint, and it will give me both the rotation and the translation. So um, if you know the pitch, you can go ahead and type that in here. Hit OK. Um, if it's spinning the wrong way, um, there's a reverse dialog box. But now you can see that I have to spin this thing to move it up and down. So it simulates that screw motion. Great for screws, um, gears, things like that. Great. Um, finally, let's go ahead and show you some snapshots and revert. So this is, it's, I'm going to quickly assemble this thing and show you this uh, snapshot and reverting for those last 10 minutes we got with each other. Um, so let's go ahead and start putting this together. I'm going to put this fairly quick um, just so you guys uh, can watch. So what I want to do is first say these two are rigidly connected. I'm just going to use an as-built joint there. This is kind of a, co a combination of both using as-built and um, regular joints. So this one I want to be Revolute. Hit OK. When you select Revolute, you just got to pick where it's rotating them around. So hit OK. Do one more as-built joint. I'm going to say these are rigid. Hit OK. But now I want this link that I driven. And you're going to notice that what I did is I designed all these off of one sketch. I'm going to come back to that sketch eventually. So when I extruded it, it was off of this, a plane through this space. So I just need to move it out a little bit. So in this case, I can't use as built joint. So I'm going to use my regular joint just by hitting J. Select that face, select that point. I'm holding Command to get to that point over there, because if not, it would cover over to this space. Get that point. Come on over to this point, select right here, flips it the wrong direction, let's pop it back, and I don't want a slider, I want a revolute, perfect, hit OK. Just, just as before, I'm going to use my uh, regular joint, pop this guy, and that one, and again, I flip it, and here we go. And right now, it's got everything, except I just want this pen to slide along this here. So I'm going to go ahead and let's close this dialog. Uh, Let's go ahead and make a as-built joint. I'm going to select this. Oh, not that one. This com keep the wrong one. That component and this component. And I want to leave the sliding motion along this axis here. Stable slide. So the ult the resultant is this right now. So I'm able to rotate this and it spins it around. Those joints are a little bit obnoxious, so I'm going to go ahead and hide those right now. So now you're able to see that we're able to move. But now, let's say I actually have no idea how, I, how long I want this slot to be. So you see it goes all the way to the back. I need a slot there. So what I could do is I can, uh, I'm just going to eyeball it, but I could actually uh, drive it with a, uh, can't go to the top here. I could drive it with a uh, drive joints to get it exactly where I want. Fortunately, I didn't get to demonstrate that, but definitely take a look at that. Um, I'm going to place it right there. And I'm going to go ahead and take a snapshot. So you're going to see what happens is the last place it was saved was over here, just a little bit off. Um, I'm going to create a snapshot. And it puts something in the timeline. Snapshots are really just storing location. It's saying that all the location is down here. If I go back before the joint, you'll see it slide a little bit up. If I go back after the joint, it goes down a little bit. So now I'm going to just say I want a Boolean combined cut. So I'm going to combine this with this. But I'm just going to cut away the negative space or where they're intersecting. But I also want to keep the tool. And the tool is this little guy. So once I hit OK and I move that out of the way, you'll see there's a hole there. And now I could use drive joints to get it to the other side, but that looks right about good. I'm going to go ahead and do that same thing. Um, but notice that I did not hit snapshot this time. I do want to hit snapshot, but let's say I forget. If I hit combine, it's just going to prompt me and say, hey, you move some components around. What do you want to do, create a snapshot? or continue and revert back to its original position. I'm going to say I want to create a snapshot. And you'll see it puts it in the timeline. So 
So I could say this component and this component again. Keep the tools cut, and now I have two circles. Last but not least, I'm just going to isolate this body, uh, create a sketch on this face. Let's continue. I'll let that revert. And all I'm going to do is finish up this slot by creating a line. That point and the line goes there, and it looks like I missed a tangency, so let's just make that tangent really quickly. And then I'm just going to extrude this out the back and make that a cut. Awesome. So finally, I'm going to unisolate. Can't see it. There it is. Unisolate. Bring those components back. And you see, it's able to move that slot distance. Nothing too complicated. I did there. Where you're really going to see this is I did some top-down design with motion. That's really the perk of having joints in the timeline and snapshots. And the really uh, beneficial part is when you go back and make changes. Let's say I want this to be 2.5. Um, I don't know. Let's come in here and say I want this to be 3. Let's say this to be 1.75. And I want like a really small slot. So let's say I want that like 0.1. So just shrink everything down off of one. Um, and then when I stop my sketch, you see how everything changed. It went down, the slot got smaller, and we're still able to simulate that motion. So that's just some of the advantages of using snapshots. We, where I could really see those advantages is maybe you're making like a switch for a light on a bike, bike light. Maybe you know one position, the other position, you could kind of do that snapshot combined cut out of there and then get rid of the middle space and make some really complicated stuff. Um, but really, that's top-down design with motion. Usually, top-down design with motion breaks because of all the external references. Here, we're all referenced in the cloud, so not, we won't have a lot of issues that way. So that was a snapshot in revert. Um, the joints in the timeline, so you'll see that the joints each get a feature, uh, feature. Other CAD tools, what they are is the assemblies are just a huge equation of a bunch of mates and constraints being uh, solved simultaneously. Here, our joints are being solved in a linear time. Where I really see the big um, advantage of that is top-down design with motion. So let's say back to that phone case example with the phone. Um, you uh, design in context this phone case. Usually what happens is you're going to have to save both of those bodies out into different part files and then part files into assembly. Here, we're all in one file. And what we can do is within that one file is we can in time say, we want to make this a joint, assign this relationship. So we can have this phone case slide um, where that point usually in other CAD tools is a different file that you're having to manage and make sure that references aren't broken. So that's some of the uh, mastering joints with Fusion. Um, I will be around for some questions and answers. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the question dialog box. If not, have a great day, guys, and keep designing in Fusion. <laughs>